Welcome everyone to the second program in this year's Food and Ideas Festival. Uh, in our first program last week, cookbook author Carolyn Phillips told us what she learned about China through learning to cook with her Chinese in-laws. I'm Dinda Elliott, the Director of Programs at China Institute, and we are so excited that tonight we're going to be talking about comfort food, the foods that get us through times of crisis, and how foods connect us to memories, history, and family. Our speakers tonight are just fabulous. So you're in for a real treat. Uh, we have Betty Liu, who is a Shanghainese American surgical resident who just wrote a beautiful cookbook called My Shanghai, filled with recipes and memories of her mother's cooking. And we're just marveling how she managed to write this book while she was in the middle of uh, medical school. We don't know, but it's quite, quite an amazing feat. Uh, we also have Vincent Chow, who's a Shanghainese via Hong Kong food entrepreneur who recently opened a restaurant in Manhattan called Mi Lu, which plays with traditional Chinese flavors. Uh, Vincent worked at 11 Madison Park and helped with their business strategy. Uh, he also worked in, rest in the restaurant business for years in Shanghai before opening Mi Lu in New York. And our moderator tonight, Xiao Qingzhou, is a real expert on comfort food, uh, as she is a former food editor and the author of a book called Chinese Soul Food, as well as her new book, Vegetarian Chinese Soul Food. Uh, so we are in for a real treat tonight. Um, why don't you all come on the stage? Uh, we're going to take some questions uh, at the end of tonight's conversation. So please make sure to type your questions into the Q&A uh, section. You'll see the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And now I'd like to hand it over to Xiao Qing and to invite you all to start the conversation. Thank Welcome. you, Dindan. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, this evening. I'm actually in Seattle, if you can see the, the uh, airport sign behind us. So I, it's actually afternoon for me, but it's dinner time for you all on the East Coast. So we're about to uh, hopefully make you a little bit hungry and salivate over delicious food. Um, so speaking of delicious food, I'm going to introduce my, my fellow panelists here today by asking each of them to pick two or three dishes that uh, they might serve or present at our virtual dinner table here. Um, maybe Betty, tell, uh, what would you pick? Well, since we are so close to the Dragon Boat Festival, I'm actually going to suggest um, zongzi in the Shanghainese way, which is, it's, a, it's a sti like a sticky rice dumpling that is wrapped in bamboo leaves um, cooked uh oh give her a second Oops. hopefully she'll be back betty is frozen uh it's all right it's all right it's all right she'll come back give her one second here vincent maybe maybe uh you want yep. to Good idea. Drop yeah. in for a second here. What would you pick for our table? Sure. Um, just a little bit of background too. I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong, so the dish that I pick it's actually really somewhat like common there. Um, one of the things that I always miss whenever I go back home is it's and maybe surprisingly, it's a curry beef brisket slash tendon with rice. Um, it's something that's really common in all the cafes in Hong Kong, um, something called Ta Tan Dang, which is literal translation to tea cafe. Um, and it's in all the fast food restaurants in Hong Kong as well. And that's something that's like, you know, very aromatic, um, very deep in flavor, but also something that not many people would think of as typical Chinese, even though now it's all over China whenever you go to a Cantonese style restaurant. Um, that's something that I, I've always loved because of you know, just something that I grew up with, but also how interesting it is when it comes to its history. So how 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 did that make make its way to the Hong Kong cafes? Yeah, I mean, there's there's the obvious influence from the British, um, you know, ruling of Hong Kong historically, and with the British ruling, there's also a lot of Indian recipes um, that came along with the Indian migrant workers, and I think at that time when it comes to 
really not appropriating, but like having to feel like, okay, something for normal Chinese people to really learn about what, you know, the, the, the British were eating or the, what the migrants were eating, it increasingly became very popular that there's something of a strong flavor profile, like a little sp spicy, but never too spicy because the Cantonese flavor is never really that. And beef was never something that popular in Hong Kong either until later on when people are you know, slightly more prosperous. And then they started using more of a Chinese cut, which is you know, incorporating tendons, which the Chinese people love the texture and eventually the fish balls, which is again, a very Hong Kong thing. And it became pretty much like one of the dish that you literally see in every restaurant in, in Hong Kong. And I think that's something that, you know, everyone does it a little differently, um, but everyone comes to love. It sounds delicious. Now I'm craving that. Welcome back, Betty. <laughs> Whoop, is she frozen again? Oh no. Looks like her screen is frozen again. Oh my goodness, um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> technology. Um, well, maybe I'll say what I would have. Um, I love um, Mapo tofu. And I, and I don't have, uh, my ancestors aren't from the Sichuan region, but that is something that my um, parents really love. They love the food of that region. And so growing up, we, did have a lot of that. So that's definitely something that would be on my table. Um, we'll give Betty a second here. Vincent, maybe you can tell us it, how, how is this curry dish that you mentioned? Is that something that you serve at your restaurant? No, actually not, not exactly. Our restaurant is not so much like serving a lot of food that is like a common recipe out there. Um, oh. Betty's back if we want to. Betty's uh, back. Jump into I'm it. sorry. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> okay, I've closed all my other programs, so hopefully this works. I, I think it's going around. I was on some Zoom calls earlier that uh, where they kept kicking people out. Um, so hopefully we don't lose you again. Um, yeah. Maybe you want to finish your story about zongzi, Shanghai style zongzi. Okay. Um, well, Dragon Boat is coming up. Um, I think it's in five days. Um, so one of the dishes if we were to have um, a meal together at this time, I would make is zongzi. So sticky rice um, with marinated pork belly, really delicious, um, wrapped in bamboo leaves and simmered for hours. The smell when it's cooking is amazing. And it's one of my favorite dishes that my mom would make. Um, so I would serve that along with um, like a side of seasoned steamed eggplant, which is another one of my favorite dishes, particularly in the hot weather um, and some stir fried greens. Mm. Sounds fantastic. Well, while you were in, oh, she's frozen again. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Oh, bummer. Okay. Well, we'll uh, why don't, what, oh, there she is. I'm also gonna okay. join with my phone. <laughs> oh, okay. That would be a great yeah. idea. Um, so, so Vincent uh, was telling us that he would have this kind of curry um, dish at the table and I'm adding mapo tofu to the, whoops. I'm adding uh, mapo tofu hey, to our if table. You're, if, Betty, if you're gonna be on your phone, you need to disconnect from the other, otherwise it's gonna be a strange echo. Okay, can you hear us? Hopefully, <laughs> hold on. She'll, she'll get on video hopefully in a sec. Sorry, everybody. The, the lovely world of, of yep. uh, awesome. Zoom here. Um, okay, well. There oh, we go, there that's is. good. Okay, great. So how about we um, kick it off a little bit now that we've talked about some of the dishes that we would have this table, what does comfort food mean to you? Um, Vincent, why don't you start? Sure. Um, for me, comfort food is like something that reminds me of one, you know, being home, um, being with family. Um, the dish that I mentioned, you know, like a curry brisket, a Hong Kong curry brisket style that is common everywhere, even though you can find it anywhere in the restaurants, my mom would make it at home still, right? And she's Shanghainese, but you know, having lived in Hong Kong for many years, she would learn the recipe and, and work on it. So that's something 
to me, it's always personal, not just for the city that I grew up in, but also, you know, a dish that my family cooked for me when I was young. Um, you know, it, it, does it remind me of my identity? I think so, you know, in, in many parts because of what it means to be growing up in Hong Kong in a multicultural society, but also in a way that's very directly tied to the dish where, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that people can pinpoint exactly where you're from. Um, and that to me has always been something interesting. So Betty, what does comfort food mean to you? How would you define that? So comfort food for me is anything that I can find, you know, some peace and some comfort in. Um, and for me, I would say the epitome of comfort food is my mom's red braised pork belly. It's a very, you know, classic famous Shanghainese dish, but everyone makes it differently. You will hear multiple, you know, people from different families use different sauces or have different proportions. Um, some people include tofu nuts, some people include eggs, some people use different cuts of, you know, pork belly, how thick they cut it. It's, it's very varied. So the way that my mom made it um, always brought me comfort. And it's actually, you know, the dish that she would make to welcome us back home um, after we moved away for college. And um, it's a dish that she knows that we would absolutely, you know, want to eat and what, what would really send the message of welcoming us home. Yeah, and, and I would say for me, I mean, I wrote two books about <laughs> with the word comfort food in it. Um, and, and for me, it was about um, capturing or collecting all of the dishes that many of us know and recognize and everybody's got their own versions of it. I have a version of pork belly as well. Um, but somehow, despite all of our different paths to this point now, we have um, somehow managed to have a lot of these similarities. And I think comfort food is, um, it, you know, it's not just something that tastes good, but it's, it's all the stuff around it, right? So it's connecting with um, your mom cooking for you. It's the idea of welcoming you home or, um, or having this um, uh, invisible connection with however mil you know, many millions of other people around the world, right? Um, so Vincent, for you, um, what, tell us a little bit about your restaurant um, and how kind of that comfort food weaves into your business. Yeah, I think, you know, when I think about Chinese food, so I'm not the only owner of, of this restaurant. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong. Uh, my parents are from Shanghai originally, and then I came to the States. My understanding of Chinese food has been very much tied to Cantonese, Shanghainese cuisine. Um, you know, very different, but, you know, very much tied to those two. Meanwhile, my business partner, who's a chef in, at 11 Madison Park for over, you know, close to a decade, she's American Chinese, also from Cantonese background, but has been living in the States cooking French and American cuisine, right? So her technique and everything is quite different. And our third partner is Australian native, but lived in China for over a decade, all over mainland China. So from Beijing to Shanghai to Sichuan to Ken, you know, Guangzhou. Her, his understanding of Chinese food is even more Northern than I, mine. And I think when all three of us kind of got together organically and talk about Chinese food, my background from Hong Kong, like really thinking about what really constitutes Chinese food, right? Like a curry Chinese, like a curry brisket dish. It's not something people think of Chinese food. And then we start talking about more and we look at the current landscape in China as well when it comes to food and how it's being done. Everyone is experimenting. Everyone is doing new things. So with our restaurant, we wanted to do the same thing and bring in familiar flavors that everyone knows um, if they're from those regions, but present it in the way that we think makes sense um, for the New York market. And that's kind of where we are. It's both really comforting, but also something that is a little bit out there. And the name of your restaurant, um, I, I read on your website, it's Mi Lu, like Rice Road, but it also yes. is. Maybe tell the story, well, say more about that. 
Yeah, so Milu, I mean, literally it means Milu, right? Like the rice roll, because we're a rice bowl place. Uh, at the same time, if you pronounce it in a different tone, you know, it also means being lost uh, directionally, uh, emotionally, whatever. And in many ways, it's kind of related to the story I just told. It's it's about being lost and discovering what it means to be Chinese and what flavors and not being confined by it. And I think especially for the new generation who are really learning more about China and different regional cuisines, it's not just about the traditional recipes and it, it's about how do we move forward while respecting all the traditions that came beforehand. Um, so that's kind of our play of words. I love that. I love that. Cause I think um, so much, there's so much talk about authenticity and it's just such a loaded word. Um, and, and we're coming at it from very different perspectives. You know, Vincent, you've got your, your history. Um, I, I was born in Taipei, but I grew up in the United States. So even though the recipes in my books are pretty traditional, um, I didn't grow up eating it in, uh, you know, on the mainland or, or in Taiwan. Um, so I haven't lived overseas. Um, so, you know, I, I always tell people when they ask me, is this authentic? It's like, well, there's a spirit of authenticity because the, the, the way the dishes come together are very traditional, but I, I use ingredients that are accessible to me. So the bok choy here is gonna taste different than the bok choy that, that you know, is, is grown in, in other regions. Um, Betty, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of your, uh, how you've approached uh, treating recipes. They, they seem pretty traditional to Shanghai. Were there some uh, liberties or some questions that you had while you were putting your book together? Definitely. You know, this, a lot of my recipes are traditional, like they're classic Shanghainese dishes, but um, how I how I describe them is these are the dishes like classic dishes, but they're being cooked in a modern kitchen by someone who is Chinese American. You know, I was born in the states, spent a lot of time in Shanghai because that's where my parents are from, and those are the flavors that they cooked for me growing up. But you know, even when they cooked these flavors and these dishes for me, it was in the Bay Area in California using the local ingredients here. So inevitably there's going to be some nuances. And, you know, we've all seen those online wars about authenticity and how people, you know, like to say that there's only one certain flavor, extra, et cetera, dish. And that's the only thing that could ever, ever live to be named that certain dish, right? But in reality, food is dynamic. It's always evolving. And I feel like it's intimately involved with time um so when people ask me like do i absolutely need you know this rice vinegar or like they can't find light versus dark soy sauce which i do call for my recipes i always tell them it's okay these recipes are a foundation like a base for you to learn technique and how to build flavors but that they can take it anywhere they want um so that's kind of how i feel about authenticity and I try to stay away from that word. <laughs> um, and I, I was thinking about how each of us are um, sort of the framework of how we approach our, our uh, work around food. And it's like, I'm, you know, Betty, you were talking about how you wanted to be able to feed yourself. You left home and needed to be able to cook this food for yourself. So then you started to learn how to cook it and those recipes resulted. And for me, it was about, I'm not pushing any, any boundaries. I, I literally just wanted to record all the family recipes so that my children and their cousins would be able to still have some connection to the foods that we grew up with. And Vincent, I see you with your work in the restaurant as like you're really thinking about what it could be in the future. So it's almost like past, present, and future, um, if you'll allow me. Uh, so can, can we maybe spin on that a little bit and, and, and how, do we, how do we stay rooted and yet 
do the things that we need to do with food. Who wants to take this one first? I mean, I can start. I, I think for me and, and Xiaoxing, you, you, you said it very well. I, I, like my journey has actually been almost like a disassociation with what's what's Chinese. When I first came to the States, having American Chinese food for the first time, I had no idea what it was. And to <laughs> me, I, I mean, like, and, and I think during those times for years, I would judge Chinese food in the States with what I grew up with, with the palate of what's traditional, of, of what's, you know, quote unquote authentic. And as I learned more about food, as I worked more in the industry, I started to really seeing how people actually approach recipe in the first place um, in the French restaurant, in the American restaurant. And then when I worked in China and started seeing Chinese chefs, the younger brigade, like looking at a traditional recipe and thinking about what they can do with newer ingredients. Like for me, it's about really discovering what does it mean for that dish to shine in the first place? And what does it mean to be something that I associate with, with Chinese food? So after all this time, I think, you know, like Betty said, the, the word authenticity is very much loaded, you know, authentic to who? And what does it mean, you know, like for how long has it, does it have to be existing for it to be authentic? Um, all the dishes that we cook, you know, in our restaurant for a Chinese person who knows the origin of the dish, the moment they eat it, they know that flavor, right? And, and I think that is as powerful as serving the exact same recipe because it's about understanding the flavor, why it works, you know, throughout the years and what you can do with it. Um, and I think there's a lot more. And I think that's what chefs do um, nowadays everywhere. That's pretty powerful. Betty, uh, you talk about seasonality. It kind of ties into that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can say anything as powerful as what Vincent just said, but um, I would agree. I think it's, I think for me, it's a lot about intent and Okay, we'll get very excited to hear. I don't, uh, I don't think anything could really. Oh, Betty, you're, you're fading out there. Betty, I wonder if you can stand next to the router, like talk, you know, talk, you know, yeah. Next to the modem, if you can get closer to the modem, because. Oh, so. <laughs> well, in the um, let's, yeah, in the meantime. So, <laughs> Vincent, uh, you also, uh, you re recently described, um, it's kind of dovetailing on what you just described. Of course. There's stories in your food, like people can taste it. So can they taste, um, can they taste that history? I think so. I mean, I would like to think so. Um, you know, as a restaurant, we don't, we don't preach, right? Like, especially, you know, we're a casual restaurant. We don't go and say, this is how you should eat it. This is, you know, a 10 minute history of it before we sell you the food. That said, you know, like every dish, if people ask about it, it's like, what's inspiration, you know? And for certain Chinese people who come in and eat a dish and they, they feel very nostalgic, actually. You know, we've had guests who lived in Yunnan and came to eat and we have a dish that's a Yunnan style kind of brisket. And it's a play of a cold beef dish that they serve with chili and surprisingly mint. And that's not something a lot of people know of Chinese cuisine. In Yunnan, they use a lot of herbs and in that dish, there's a lot of chili, a lot of garlic and mint. And instead of cold beef, we use a brisket and it's stewed. And when they taste it, they're like, yes, it feels like home. And for most people, it's just delicious. You know, it's, it's you know, we call it by the name and many people have problems with that. But it's also a way for us to kind of communicate where we are taking inspirations from. Hmm. Betty, maybe finish your thought. <laughs> Where did I cut off? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, we were talking about um, how the, the stories that come from eating food. Um, so even if you don't say specifically that this dish has this story, can people taste that 
So what might people taste from your food? Oh no. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. Um, oh, so, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep riffing here. Um, so for me, like if people, the, I've tried to make my recipes very streamlined and very doable so that they're accessible for the broadest number of people. Um, Cause one of the, one of the issues I have with a lot of cookbooks and, and having been around cookbooks for um, a lot of my professional life as a food editor and now um, as part of the James Spear Foundation, judging cookbooks, um, you know, I see a lot of different types of books that were published just to publish the book, or they were celebrity books, or um, somebody's pet project, or you know, any number of reasons that that people publish these cookbooks. And often, for for the home cook, they're just not accessible. And if we want people, if we want more people to cook everyday Chinese food or everyday Taiwanese food, then there has to be, um, there has to be an approach that is more like an on-ramp, right? So you bring more people into the fold, you give them permission to not do things exactly right. If you don't have a walk, you're not quite ready to invest in all of, all of the equipment or, um, you know, to use what you have. And, and if you think about how the Chinese diaspora has cooked throughout the centuries, I mean, we use whatever we have, wherever we are. Um, you know, I remember when we first immigrated to the States, we barely had anything. So it was whatever we had is what we, is what we used. Um, so for me, it's, it's definitely trying to make this kind of cooking more forgiving for people. And then once they get into it, if they want to geek out, uh, there are plenty of books that will take you through, uh, you know, 5,000 years of history and, and uh, all of the regions and subregions and like, you can totally do that. Um, so, so for me, I was just saying, okay, let's, let's, here's, here's how vast uh, all of the cuisines are. Let's narrow it down to something that can, is, that somebody can actually replicate in their home kitchen, bring them into the fold, and then tell them all of the wonderful stuff that that there is to know. Um, I think Betty's back. Sort of, she's I'm in and out. <laughs> I'm, I'm using my cell phone internet, so I'm looking for a place that I have bars. Just keep keep talking for now. Okay, we'll keep talking. Maybe you can just uh, maybe you can just talk, Betty, without the video. That might help a little bit. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Cool. Um, so uh, let's see. You haven't had a, a chance to talk much, so um, maybe talk a little bit about let's let's um, transition. Take us take us to Shanghai. I I love how you sort of walk us through when you go there to visit your family. Um, it's a very different experience from somebody who's a tourist who goes and they just end up at the Bund. Um, what, you know, <laughs> for, when you go to Shanghai, walk us, take us to the neighborhoods and where would you go? What would you see, smell? What's the first thing you'll eat? Yeah, so, um, you know, I usually stay with my, my extended family. My entire extended family lives in Shanghai. And um, I'm pretty much at their disposal. Um, we don't really hit, you know, the big tour sites like the Bund. Instead, the favorite thing and the first thing that I like to do is um, go with my, you know, aunts and uncles, cousins to the local markets. Um, I love going to just a bunch of like really robust breakfast markets in Shanghai. And, you know, I wouldn't even be able to pinpoint where they are. Um, but my extended family has their, you know, favorite areas. And then the other thing that I really love to do is everything is so, so fresh and seasonal over there. The way that my family cooks is they would go out every single morning to see what's available locally. Um, and they'll choose the produce for, you know, the day or maybe two days. And we'll base what we cook on what we find at the markets. And then the next day we go back. So everything is so, 
so hyper seasonal um, and so based on local what you can find that everything is just so fresh. And I think that is kind of an epitome of what the cuisine, what the cuisine really is. And you talked um, in your book about um, that local cuisine. Can you can you say more about that? What is the local Shanghainese cuisine? Because it's it's even more uh, local than we think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Vincent, you have roots in Shanghai too, so jump in if, if you have any comments. Um, but so across China even and America, a lot of people would label Shanghainese food as sweet. They just say like, oh, this is, this is the sweet cuisine. Um, or when I tell people that I'm from Shanghai, they comment, you know, oh, you must like a lot of sugar in your food. Um, but to really just label Shanghainese cuisine as sweet is, is too much of an oversimplification. And I would call it, you know, very seasonal, very fresh, uses a lot of vibrant flavors. Um, but I think above all else, the cuisine really respects the natural flavor of the food that it uses. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, you know, dousing food in heavy sauces, um, but everything that we cook is, is a way to enhance the natural flavors, which is also why cooking locally, you know, using seasonal ingre ingredients is so important. And you don't really have to do much with it, right? Like we, um, I think in the Western, um, just in my experience teaching, um, you know, people expect that things should always have these super pungent flavors. Everything should have garlic in it and, or chili sauce or, or uh, whatever, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's like one note. Um, so maybe say a little bit more about um, appreciation for those nuanced flavors. Yeah, like one of my um, one of my favorite dishes is like a very like using very young bok choy, um, and they actually call it like chicken feather green. It's like the bok choy is you know the size of your finger, and it's very tender. It's like early spring dish, um, like kind of winter winter, and it's just really. It's such a tender green that all you need to do is cook it in a little bit of broth. Um, and that's that's all the flavoring you need. So, I mean, a lot of the flavor comes from the, the bok choy itself um, and then also from the broth that it's cooked in. But we don't need to drizzle it with chili oil. We don't need to, you know, sprinkle a bunch of salt or pepper on it. Um, it's, it's very subtle, but also very elevated in how how simple it is. Mm, sounds delicious. Vincent, any thoughts on on those types of flavors? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I do agree with Betty. I think a lot of people have a misconception of what Shanghainese food is. Um, I think especially in the States and, and also just running on what you said earlier, you know, like how to make people appreciate the different regional cuisines like a little bit more. And I think right now, actually, in cities like New York, San Francisco, or everywhere in the States, really, you're seeing more and more regional Chinese restaurants doing their regional food. And I think that's a great starting point because I mean, China is huge as, as we know, and most people can't even tell, you know, three or four different types of cuisine from there. So that's a good starting point. Let's say going to a Shanghainese restaurant and not having, you know, gong bao ji ding and not having like gong bao chicken or not having a, a Cantonese dim sum dish because they're completely unrelated, right? Um, and really starting to one, learn about that and then to really appreciate the nuances that Betty was talking about. And, and I'm actually really happy these days because I'm seeing more people doing that in restaurants and I think more people writing about them too in blogs. And I think for American Chinese who are discovering their roots, but also for people who've traveled from China and living in the States now to find something that they miss I mean, it's a great thing to have. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot to learn, even for me, I'm learning about the different regional Chinese food, and I'm glad that it's actually happening. It is. It's it, it's really wonderful, and it seems like um, with 
with all these different options, um, it does open up the opportunities for us to learn more and for us to learn more because none of us know everything there is to know. Um, and I think that uh, there's this expectation that if you have written a Chinese cookbook that somehow you know everything there is to know about all the cuisines and that's just uh, not the reality. Um, there is a question that somebody um, put in the q and I thought might be good to throw in now, which is how do you compensate for ingredients that are difficult to find locally? That might be a question for you, Vincent, um, not only just sure. for home cooking, but for restaurants. I never force it. Um, you know, like if we call for something that's seasonal and only exists in China, I mean, that's not helpful. Like you said, you know, writing something like that in the cookbook it's for writing sake, like it doesn't help. And there are often times that like, I would watch YouTube videos like that are Chinese chefs from China talking about the dish. And I'm like, I can't cook that here because I can't find half of the ingredients. Um, but I think once you understand what that ingredient is supposed to do, and I think there are really good cookbooks that explain, you know, why certain things work and certain YouTube channel that also explains that, um, then you can find substitute. You know, uh, you don't use things just because you can buy it in Chinatown because there are things that are not seasonal and it just won't taste that great. And sometimes the flavor when it comes to sauces, thankfully, most sauces you can find, um, it's really about just experimenting, using something else. Um, that's what we do at the restaurants. We have to um, because otherwise the food won't taste very good. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid of experimenting because even my mom does it all the time in Hong Kong. I mean, she's Shanghainese and she couldn't find the Shanghainese ingredient in the Hong Kong local market. She figures something out. Because it's, it's all about the balance. There's balance in the dish, there's balance in the meal. Um, and then if you understand, to your point, uh, if you understand how, you know, what, what kind of balance you're trying to strike with texture and flavors and um, seasonality, then, then, you know, you can, you can still put together that dish in the spirit that it was intended, I would say. Um, Betty, are you still, are you still with us? Oh, I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. tell. I, I um, agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why don't, why don't you chime yeah. in as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I agree with Vincent um, and, and yourself, don't force it. Uh, there was a dish I really wanted to include in my cookbook, uh, it's crystal shrimp. Um, but in the end, I decided to omit it because, you know, that dish is all about like the, the freshness and the sweetness of this very specific, tiny freshwater shrimp found in the Jiangnan area. So, you know, I've never been able to find that here. Um, and, you know, to do that with like, you know, some of the larger shrimp, which is like delicious prepared in other ways, but not this way. Um, it just wasn't, it, it felt like I was forcing it. So I decided not to include that. Oh no, <laughs> we keep losing people. <laughs> um, well, so, oh, there's Betty again. It's back. Oh. This is so yeah. lovely. <laughs> um, okay, so we have, so sorry, guys. <laughs> we have some uh, additional questions here from from the audience. Um, uh, let's see. Curious to get your thoughts on Chinese food, i.e., General Tso's chicken, etc., labeling as comfort in the American pop culture, um, i.e., take takeout food. How are you? Let's see, how are you doing today to shape or even change that by bringing more nuanced regional cuisines? Um, for me, I, I would say that, you know, it, it American Chinese or Chinese American food is its own thing and there's nothing wrong with it. I like General's chicken. It's not something I grew up with. And when people would, I grew up in the restaurant business in central Missouri. And when people would come into our restaurant and ask us for things like that, we were like, I don't know what General's chicken is. What's crab rangoon? Um, there's no cream cheese in our cooking. Uh, but so we had to actually learn how to make some of those things to, uh, to, to 
satisfy the customers. Um, but you know, I don't I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that food that has that kind of food put me through college. So I'm not gonna um, say bad things about it. It's, it is different from what we know as um, food that we grew up with or the types of dishes that we, and that kind of those simpler flavors, more natural flavors. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know that it needs to be curbed per se. Um, any thoughts on that, Vincent or Betty? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's different. Um, can, you, can you hear me, Xiaoqi? Yes. Okay. Um, like it's, it's different. There's just nothing wrong with it. And I remember that, you know, sometimes my family would go out and specifically get Chinese takeout food. Um, if we were having a really busy day or just wanted something different, it was almost like a different genre um, of food to us. And, you know, like Xiaoqi said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. And who are we to say, you know, what makes comfort food or not, because it's so individualized. Yeah, I mean, I'll add to it. I, I mean, I love American Chinese food. <laughs> I think, I mean, certain dishes is just, I mean, it's to me, it's a new cuisine and I don't think there's anything wrong with it um, per se, you know, the dishes itself and, and how people love it. I think what's problematic, it's how people associate with all of Chinese food, right? You know, there's this misconception of everything's sweet, everything is, you know, gooey, everything is like super unhealthy or fried. I think that's the association that's problematic. Um, American Chinese food by itself has its place, has its history. And, and I think it's a great thing that brought a lot of people their livelihood, you know, throughout the, the times. And, you know, even today, I think it's an integral part of American culture, um, if not, you know, more specifically American Chinese culture. Um, that said, you know, as people understand more of different Chinese regional cuisines, I think people are going to start recognize that American Chinese food, it's also just that. It's one of the variation that people cook with local ingredients and, you know, trying to please like the, the local, which none of them were Chinese at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, once in a while, General So Chicken Kicks, you know, really hits the spot. <laughs> it totally does. And, and if we can segue a little bit, you know, speaking of uh, these types of restaurants, you know, the, during this pandemic year where everything has shut down and we've all had to rely um, or connect with restaurants only through takeout, um, you know, Chinese restaurants have been there, but they've also suffered uh, probably, uh, you know, because of all the, the anti-Asian um, stuff that's going out on out there. And there's also been this movement to try to save Chinatown. Grace Young has been pushing that across the country. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, wh what did you order from other Chinese restaurants if you did during the pandemic? What got you through that? Um, me? Uh, I sure. mean, I... I was opening a Chinese restaurant during the pandemic, so that was a little different. Um, I mean, to be fair, I, I do think there are, I mean, racism is not new, right? And I think what's surprising for me as someone who didn't grow up in the States to really not experience it like firsthand, but to really understand a different role it plays for American Chinese versus me, you know, in, in many ways. And also just seeing how it affects entire neighborhoods and entire you know, group of people who look, you know, a certain type, right? I mean, even nowadays, like months after the worst time of pandemic, we have prank calls, you know, for at mm -hmm. the restaurant that people would, you know, call and order, you know, like random stuff. And it's obviously based on one teenager being bored or, you know, racist stereotypes, right? That said, I think, uh, you know, the political climate didn't help much um, in the States when it comes to fanning that stereotype in certain ways but at the at the end of the day I do think you know things are changing um especially in in certain areas in the states and I think you know Chinatown and also newer places and China Institute like having these kind of talks as people really learn more about the nature of the food itself the culture itself and hopefully it gets better and to be frank like 
all New Yorkers love all kinds of food anyway, and most Americans would never not take Chinese takeout just because of a stereotype. So I'm not that worried. Um, you know, I'm actually quite hopeful. Betty, what uh, what got you through all the pandemic? Did you did you order much takeout? Did you order any Chinese takeout? I ordered everything. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, so I actually don't cook that much on a regular basis, um, just because my job is so time consuming. Um, so when I do cook for enjoyment, it's usually on the weekend or I would make, you know, big batches of wontons or something to last me through the week. So I ordered a lot of takeout during the pandemic. Um, a lot of, you know, not Chinese food, but also some Chinese food, um, I think I never really actually used to eat out for Chinese food, but in a, in a desire to support Chinatown, um, show solidarity, I started to explore the different Chinese restaurants in Boston. And, you know, I noticed, I think what Vincent was saying in New York, um, there's actually a, a lot of regional, um, like restaurants that serve regional cuisine. So it was really delightful to discover that. Now we're really hungry. <laughs> um, so there's, there are a bunch of questions. Um, so one specifically related to food memories. I know a lot of the foods that, that we have talked about or described connect us to certain memories, but is there something in particular that takes you back to a certain time, a place? Um, what's something that when you, you know, what's your Madeline? <laughs> um, so I have so many memories associated with noodle soup for me um, we would get them all the time like as a breakfast food or other meals but a lot of times for breakfast in, in Shanghai and Suzhou which is right next to Shanghai um, but also here um, it, it would be kind of the one of the go-to quick dishes that my parents would make me and in particular when I was in high school you know if I had an exam my my dad who usually is not the one to make us breakfast would get up early just so he could make us like a very quick breakfast noodle soup and it was amazing so whenever I make that for myself or for other people that memory comes back mm. sounds delicious and Vincent we know you um, like the curry <laughs> but what else? Well, the curry, curry aside, I think something that's really difficult to find um, here is just a very traditional like Cantonese boiled soup. Mm. It, you know, it takes like hours to make. They use different herbs, different like Chinese, like, but there's no, you know, uh, ingredients. And then they use different local ingredients when it comes to, let's say, lotus root or pork. And one, I don't think it it is popular because it is a very particular thing that even within China is not that popular. It's a very regional thing that is, you know, health beneficial and also just something that people focus on. But it's almost impossible to find here. So during the pandemic, like we, you know, my wife and I would do that at home, you know, and, and make it and just try to find that kind of comfort. It's warm, you know, soup that is just nurturing and it's healthy. It's you know, that's something that I miss. And, you know, the moment I can go to, you know, go back to Hong Kong, you know, without three weeks of quarantine, that's what I'm going to get. <laughs> um, for me, it would probably be uh, steamed egg and tomatoes. So when we first came to the United States, we lived in um, just tiny, tiny little apartment student, uh, student housing because my, my dad was going to school. And my mom would work nights. And so my dad would, my dad went to school in the day, mom would work nights. And then uh, that meant my dad would make dinner. And so one of the dishes that he would make is the steamed egg. And he, I don't know why I didn't ask him how he made that dish before he passed away, but that was like the one recipe I never um, got the, like the full story behind that. And so, uh, for my latest book, I actually 
try to recreate that flavor um, in a recipe. And, and I don't know if it's exactly right. And it's probably more that I, I associated with this childhood memory of being in this tiny apartment and, and you know, being um, uh, too short to even see inside the walk, but enjoying this dish at the, at the, um, at the dinner table. And so it just reminds me of my, of my late father. Um, okay, let's see. Let me look in here on the questions. Um, oh gosh, some of these are long. People are telling stories. <laughs> I think that's great. We're inspiring stories within the questions. Um, all right, so somebody is asking, I could never understood stand about the lobster sauce in the shrimp and lobster sauce when there's no lobster in it. Uh, but it's one of her favorite dishes. So um, what, what is that all about? Do you, do either of you know anything about the lobster sauce? I actually don't, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm curious to hear about this and learn more about this. <laughs> uh, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that speaks to what we're talking about, right? Like, I think a lot of people know certain dishes that Chinese people have never heard of. <laughs> and um, and so not, I, not even so that, but never order. <laughs> but never order. Because, like, if you and I walk into a Chinese restaurant, we would never order that based on the description. <laughs> no. And I, I think it, it speaks to one of those dishes that... Um, Chinese chefs were trying, you know, of a certain era would try to uh, create dishes that would appeal to a more Western palate. And from, don't quote me on this. I, I think it's that, that the sauce was, um, I guess, originally created for a lobster dish, but then they, they uh, uh, used it for a different type of seafood. And so it just kind of went from there. But who knows? I mean, it's like um, any number of these types of dishes where uh, like shrimp St. Paul or, you know, all these things that like Trader Vic's and the Crab Rangoon. I mean, how did that even, were egg foo young, those kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. So somebody, I feel like we already talked about that. Um, oh, so wontons, that has come up. We know, Betty, that you love wontons. You're obsessed with wontons. <laughs> obsessed, yes. <laughs> we need to hear a little bit about why this obsession and, and um, there are different <laughs> kinds of wontons. I've only known like one kind of wonton. So tell me, tell me about yeah. wontons. Okay, um, so in, in Shanghai, um, you know, oh, first of all, I feel like wontons is, is one of those pretty universal dishes that's made all over China in different ways. I have a close friend in Sichuan who has a, a very specific way she likes to do it. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna speak to the, the way that I was taught and what I grew up eating. So in Shanghai, there's two types of wontons. There's a big wonton, which is the one that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and there's small wonton. So I'll just start with the small wonton. Um, these are, it's not so much about the filling. The filling acts just as like a little bit of flavoring. If you imagine like a normal wonton wrapper, the filling, which is usually, you know, pork with some seasoning, is a little smear, like just a smudge on the wonton wrapper. And then it's crinkled up. Not, it's nothing elegant about the wrapping. It's just crinkle it up you cook it in um, a really flavorful broth. And it's more about like the mouthfeel and the texture um, and you slurp it in and less about the actual filling. Uh, so that's great. It's a great breakfast item. Um, I, I actually don't usually eat it for any other meal, but I don't see why you wouldn't be able to if you wanted to. Um, and then the big wontons, um, they're one of my favorite dishes. I actually make this on a probably... I make this the most out of any other recipe in the book because I can freeze big batches of them and they make an excellent meal prep. Um, I usually make it either with pork or shrimp, pork and shrimp, excuse me. 
or pork and some sort of green. Shepherd's purse, if I can find it. Um, and I love using the leaves of Chinese celery, which if you've seen Chinese celery, they're like thinner, stalked, longer, have a more herby flavor um, than its American counterpart, than the thicker ones. And using the leaves of that celery flavor, do the one it's really delicious. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see, I can go on and on about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can cook it in soup or <laughs> in, a, in a sauce. <laughs> um, but right. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> what about you, I mean, Benson? I shared this. I, sh I share the same enthusiasm <laughs> as Betty because as she mentioned, you know, my, my parents are from Shanghai and I, you know, at home I eat Chinese food. So we would have both type, the, the largest type or the smaller type, just like her, the smaller ones usually are breakfast item in soup, um, usually accompanying something else. And the larger ones also in soup, but then we would add toppings, you know, like fried eggs that are cut into strips, uh, pickled vegetables. And it's, it's a very comforting meal. And if we have leftover, we refrigerate it and pan fry it the next day. And then in Hong Kong, wonton is a completely different thing, right? You have the wonton soup, which use a very different kind of skin, different fillings. So at the end of the day, it's, it, and we serve wontons in our restaurant, but you know, for most people, we describe them when they don't know what it is, it's, it's dumplings that we boiled. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause you know, at the end of the day, it means different things to different Chinese people and to different people in the world. So it, it, it's about which ones we like, how we associate you know, ourselves with which, and they're all good. <laughs> so I have a quick wonton uh, <laughs> anecdote and then um, Jim is gonna take over to wrap up. Um, so in my family's restaurant, I was the chief wonton maker. And when you make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wontons, it's this repeated uh, work. And to entertain myself, I would see how quickly I could make a tray of wontons. And once I timed myself and it was something like 98 wontons in 12 minutes. So I don't make them that fast anymore, but um, that's what happens when you have to, to make them in bulk uh, for the restaurant. So that's, that's the you know, round the world stories about wontons. And I hand it back to you, Dinda. <laughs> so, so awesome. I am truly starving at this point. So, wow, what a conversation. So I want to ask one last question, if I could, from for all of you, is can you each share what is your favorite food memory? You know, so Vincent, for you, it might be from Hong Kong, for Xiaoqing, I don't know if it's from the States or from Taiwan, if it, Betty, it might be from Shanghai, but can you share a favorite food memory? I mean, I, I did I thought my the egg steamed egg one was oh. probably, yeah. I have that's that, that's, that's one a of my favorite one. Yeah, and connecting to family and it's so meaningful. Um, for me, it would actually not be a Cantonese dish. It would be a Shanghainese like steamed crab, like da da xie, um, which is seasonal. Uh, usually only around June to September. That's like the best season for it in Shanghai. And it's a group of family getting together on a round table and you just have the crab in front of you with all the other dishes, but nobody cares about them. It's really just a crab itself with a vinegar, with ginger. And uh, the most fascinating part for me is when everyone gets together as, as kids, you know, it's really difficult to eat because Chinese people eat crab with pans and tea. They don't really use tools. <laughs> um, so one is a rite of passage to learn how to eat it properly. Um, and as we have, you know, as I got married, my wife is from Beijing. She's never really eaten it with her hands to learn that part. And my brother got married to a Japanese woman and she was appalled by the fact that you use your teeth to crack open the you know, crab. And those become memories of a very specific dish in a very specific culture, kind of bringing together people. Um, so that's always something quite special. That's wonderful. Betty? Vincent. So Vincent, you're not gonna believe this, but I was gonna share a very similar story. And that's actually one of my favorite memories too is you know, getting Harry Pad in the fall with my extended family and my family. And of course, you know, being American Chinese or Chinese American myself, I was very bad.
you know, breaking open the crab and extracting all the, the you know, all the meat and juices from the crab. So that was definitely memorable having everyone, you know, laugh at me in a loving way <laughs> and also teach me how to do it properly. So you had to learn how to get, how to get messy with the crab. Oh, a hundred percent. Wow. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry to the audience about, you know, for the technical difficulties, but Betty, you're a champ. Thank you for coming in, you know, on audio, even though it's hard to get the visuals going. Xiao Qing, you're a wonderful moderator. Thank you so much. And Vincent, you know, brilliant um, thoughts about Shanghai and Hong Kong and your restaurant. And now I think we're all starving and we want to go on and, uh, you know, make some of our, our own new food memories. So, um, Thank you so much for joining us and everybody join join us again, please. Next week, we've got um, another great food conversation, which is about uh, in search of the best, the world's best soy sauce and the kind of rise of the artisanal, a new artisanal movement in the Chinese food world. So that'll be another very fun conversation. But I just want to thank you all so much for, for enduring and, um, and bringing us this wonderful conversation. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.